Well, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's really wonderful to tie two things in my life that I love, this country and uh, the topic of food security. So I am very, very happy to be here amongst old friends again. And I'm going to... Uh, have a very short amount of time to try to stimulate all the young scientists in the audience, or the old ones too, like us, uh, to uh, get a little bit excited about the potential that there's, in my, one of my passions in life in the last 10 years has been to the strong belief that there is a way that the advanced sciences can connect with um, the needs of downstream agriculture to do effective science. And Israel was always, I think, a leader in, in very, very smart, focused, applied sciences in agriculture that was very strongly science-based. So I'm going to just have some fun with this uh, and try to inspire you with some examples of uh, things that have been successful that might be successful in the future. And... Uh, I'm going to start with a little bit of fun here. This is my great great grandfather, Abba Shila Saba Shili, and he he is uh, he was called Reverend Carpenter, and he was a preacher, a minister in the church over there uh, that was in Wabash, Indiana. Indiana, there's Chicago's right up there to get everybody oriented, and uh, he was. If you go outside the village of Wabash, it's all cornfields. So many of his um, congregation, the people he preached to, were farmers of the region, and he knew farming very well. And when he retired, he was much loved by his congregation. They paid, in 1890, they paid to send him and his wife to the Holy Land, Israel, and Egypt as a grand thank you for his life and service to the church. And he wrote a diary uh, by hand of this trip, which I have inherited. And those of you who knew my late husband, Yoash Adia, um, Yoash loved this diary. He read it over and over. And his favorite part in this diary was his discussion of the, what he called the Jezreel Valley. Uh, you call it Emek Israel. And I just grabbed this picture of probably something like what this would have looked like as he stood up maybe on the slopes of Mount Tabor looking over Emak Israel in the uh, late 18, 19, uh, 1800s. And the thing he wrote that Yoss absolutely loved was he saw the potential for agriculture in this valley. And he looked down and he said, this could be the land of milk and honey that we read about in the Bible. And he said, all it really needs is one good Wabash farmer to come and do something with it. And, and this was, Yoash would love this, love this. And in fact, he was right. He just got the wrong people to be the farmers uh, because um, this is a picture, wouldn't have been too much longer after he was here, of Jewish pioneers who really did come. And that's Emek Israel today. And it's a tribute to the innovation and the energy of uh, Jewish farmers that have, that have made this possible. And indeed, I think there's no question that uh, Israeli agriculture has, has much to offer the, the developing world in, in terms of agriculture and, and lots of other areas as well. No question about it. Um, you're positioned because uh, being in a dry country to be some of the world's experts in arid and semi-arid zone agriculture. And uh, no question, you all know, leaders in irrigation, all the way from high-end fertigation with complex computer-controlled systems down to gravity feed systems for the poor, um, salinity-tolerant crops. And I, you know, I, I don't know the group that's doing this, but looking on the Internet, I was very fascinated by some some work that involves integration of, of farming systems, of aquaculture, fodder production, animal industries, how you can take limited water and you can uh, make an integrated system where you can grow fish and you can create uh, a, 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 an entire system with limited water. Um, sophisticated marketing, and believe me, now we're moving away if, if there's ever to be success in food security, you have to move away from subsistence agriculture. And a lot of that is to make 
agriculture economically profitable. And it has to be strategic, and it has to be pro-poor in, in its design. But I, I was always impressed that Yoss, when he led the Volcani, used to, and he educated me about agriculture, uh, said they, strategically for Israel, you think about productivity per unit water, because that's the limiting thing. These are the ways people need to think, you know, how does he think strategically about what you're best at? And you, it makes much more sense to use your water to grow roses and import wheat uh, than um, uh, vice versa. Uh, certainly the innovative and applied sciences I've always been impressed with, and you here with your outstanding universities and strong science. So there's no question you can do things. Now, <clears throat> when you look at limited money to work on agriculture in the developing world, or any project in the developing world, you, you, you over and over the question comes up, look, all these people really need, <laughs> there's so many existing technologies that aren't being applied out there. And really that's where we should put our money, it's just, you know, mechanization, uh, it brings some irrigation, better access to good seed and fertilizer and so on. And I would say they're absolutely right for a lot of the money. But still, we always need an innovation pipeline of new ideas, and that's where you would come in. So I am a strong believer that uh, there is a way to... Uh, upstream and downstream can work together. So now I'm going to give you some ideas. And I didn't know Adrena was going to mention sub one. But uh, I'm, I'm going to start with something that I thought, oh, you'll all laugh. Israelis don't worry about too much water. But the weather helped me today. <laughs> so too much water maybe impresses you more today than it would have last week. Uh, but in many parts of Asia, and south in Southeast Asia, uh, excess flooding can lead to greater than a billion dollars worth of losses in crops. And this, the work on what I'm going to tell you about very briefly um, represents to me one of the nicest examples of a collaboration that works between upstream and downstream. Uh, and it starts with, a, this is the sub-1 locust. It's a genetic locust in rice that uh, was a major QTL the breeders came up with from a variety that, that the folks at Erie, one of the 15 international centers of the CGIR, International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines. Um, here it shows you how dramatic this is. This, is this, this line has the sub-1 gene. The control does not. The good allele of the sub-1 gene. And the, it, it can survive uh, flooding for t up to 10 days longer than a normal rice variety. And this is, I mean, dramatic, a single gene. Uh, and so he, Dave and his colleagues were breeders. They identified the locus as a QTL. And then the collaboration was between Erie and the Philippines. That's where this identification breeding work went with Pam Ronald's lab at UC Davis and uh, Julia Bailey Sayre's lab at University of California at Riverside. Now Pam's group cloned the sub-1 locus in rice. It turns out it's not just one gene, it's three, and that became very valuable to the breeders to know that, but they are linked. Uh, Julia's lab then went on, has done beautiful work to get some idea of how it works, the sub-1 gene. Um, and I'm not going to, this is not a big heavy science talk, but this is pretty easy to understand. It turns out that this gene, sub-1A, it, it's an ethylene response factor, meaning that w a, when a plant gets submerged, it makes the gas, hormone ethylene, turns on the expression of this sub-1 gene. This is a, <clears throat> a, a gene that then controls the expression of a number of other genes. And when plants are submerged, you want to shut down and wait. And so the sub-1 uh, blocks GA responses that now shut down, uh, and so the plant will wait. But then it turns out, which was not known before, that when plants then get out of being flooded and they begin to get oxygen again, they start making free radicals from the oxygen. And that is toxic to the plants. And, and this gene also controls uh, detoxification of these free radicals. So it helps you 
come out of the process. And then as you further come out of flooding, the plant actually feels like it's <laughs> dehydrated or, or it's in dry conditions. So there's sort of an adaptive response that goes on. And it turns out sub-1 also controls uh, uh, the uh, adaptation there to make it not feel so thirsty again. And so uh, what's beautiful about this is that uh, this information, the cloning of the locus, and the understanding that only one of the three subgenes was the good one, the other actually wasn't so good, and that's a challenge for the breeders, uh, and it raises a lot of interesting questions. What's happening now in Asia <clears throat> is that this locus is now, as you can imagine, because it's a dramatic effect, this is a real single gene thing that's it's got the right, it's something useful, and you could just use transgenic approaches and drop it right into any line you wanted, right? Uh, but it's being introgressed by a strategic decision, no transgenic, into the plants through breeding. And that's not so good in, in a science sense because there are three genes and the other, one of the others actually you'd rather not have it. Call that linkage drag. You bring the bad gene along with the good one when you can't just insert the good one alone. Um, and so this is an example where the strategic decision is not science-based, but rather they know that if they did the transgenic approach, they'd be tied up in regulatory for years. Whereas if they go ahead and, and breed and use the information, which is still valuable, the sequence information, to read the gene in, uh, and that that's gets you to this, uh, something that I think Israel, in, in terms of their own agriculture, has faced, that you have fabulous scientists. You could be developing all sorts of interesting GM products from, for fruits and vegetables particularly, make a great contribution in that area. But your export market is largely Europe. You're not doing it for obvious strategic reasons as well. Um, and uh, it might be interesting then to just have a little brief discussion about, well, what's the situation now in Africa uh, or other places around the world? What's going on now? Well, in Asia, golden rises into its 10th year. Before, and still not deployed to farmers. The technology is there, but probably they're turning the corner. <laughs> probably in 2013, if all goes well, that may actually get out. And uh, some of the things I've been doing focus more on Africa. Um, in South Africa's had transgenic plants for quite some time, um, but um, uh, a little breakthrough in Burkina Faso, a little small country that Monsanto worked very strategically with the breeders there to integrate uh, BT genes into uh, their own cotton lines. That's been a huge success. Uh, it's out in the fields and, and uh, the uptake by farmers is, is incredible. Egypt, not much, but um, there, the thing that's changed is that there are field trails now in many countries. So for the first time, instead of just blah, 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 talk about how great are transgenics or blah, 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 how terrible they are, now there's a chance to put things in the field and see them. And some of these will be losers. Unfortunately, most of the losers are the private se public sector efforts. And the winners, of course, are the big major companies that have high quality products. But the public sector now is coming along with some very promising things like BT cowpea, uh, high vitamin A enriched uh, cassava, banana. There are some interesting public sector projects out there. But, oh, but I just wanted to say that I think in terms of a, of a new market, just throw out the thought that uh, you can't talk seriously about transgenics for, Israel, for Europe as a market now, but you could think about an exploration of a whole continent that might be receptive to this, uh, this approach uh, in the future. It's looking promising. And, and uh, here's an area of science, hard science, that um, uh, I think could, will potentially make a difference in the regulatory situation, at least from a sensible science-based standpoint. What you would like when you insert a gene into a plant, you don't generally have any control over where it falls into the chromosome. And for that reason, the, the, uh, it, it can have different, different transgenic events behave a bit differently because the gene got randomly inserted in different places. 
But if you can always know, this is a good site. It doesn't affect anything else about the plant. We're going to put the gene right there. Or even better, you can say the sub one, let's say. A bad uh, flooding intolerant plant will have a sub one gene, but its allele is not working right or not effective. So just change. Just do homologous recombination. Just put the good one and knock out the bad one and put the good one right where the old one was. In a sense, that's, that's what a breeder would, it's a breeder's dream. And it can be done. Plants now, there are new technologies where you can use zinc finger designs and so on to do very specific swapping of bad alleles for good genes to bad. And uh, just to say, you know, Avram Lavi at the Weizmann Institute has been one of the people that's been very much involved in the hard science of homologous recombination. And if you could do this, I think you can make a very good argument that we, we know exactly what we're doing when we do this. It's the most precise kind of breeding. All we're doing is just putting a better variant of the same gene. Hard science will make that possible. This is also the technology that's being used in gene therapy in humans, replacing a bad with a good gene. Um, one of the things I think that has happened in Israel because transgenics haven't been uh, um, a viable product for you, uh, is that uh, you have very strong molecular breeding. You've applied the advances in science to breeding. And uh, just Danny Zamir is an example of uh, use of genetic diversity and with all of the new tools of genomics, genome sequencing and so on, it's very easy now for uh, um, even farmers in Africa trained by Seganet, and I'm sure she'll talk about it herself, but anyway, that even, even, not, even not farmers, that's not quite true, even breeders in national programs in Africa now, through training like uh, Seganet's institute give, can recognize, can be trained to use SSR markers, it'll move to SNP side effect, uh, to go and look at their own lines. Are they stable? Are my lines pure? Are they clean? Uh, what's the diversity in my breeding is stock of breeding? Should I bring in some more diversity? It's simple enough technology now that it can come. And uh, Danny's kind of work on introgression lines, Israel has made an, a fantastic contribution to bringing in genes from wild relatives and looking at their phen how they affect phenotype. Uh, lots of excitement there. And I think that more and more we're going to see breeding <laughs> being done in the laboratory and less and less in the field uh, when you can predict phenotypes based on genotypes. Uh, and that, uh, I'm not going to go through that one. I just wanted to, computational genomics, you know, where uh, EvoGene here in Israel is another example that I uh, just, that you, the power of the computer to analyze molecular pathways and how they interact. And, and so you can, from this, you can maybe make predictions. If you would overexpress this gene and this tissue, you might get this happening. Um, and that's the kind of thing for salt tolerance, for example. Uh, EvoGene has, been, uh, has uh, uh, patents that have been uh, licensed by now major companies as well, using the computational power to, to address agricultural problems. Um, I'm going to switch from crops for a few minutes here. Just uh, it's, Israel always had a strong program in, in the Balkani, at least in soil science. And uh, it's a huge problem, particularly in Africa. Farmers are not stupid. They would love to use fertilizer. They don't have access to it usually. And they know that they should return part of the residues to the soil, but they have so many other needs. They use the residues for, for building or for burning. and so. They have choices and decisions, and usually the, their decision is they don't return anything to the soil. So through the generations, many of these soils are quite depleted. And so, you know, there are some practical things, but when, but when you look at, at the access to inorganic fertilizer, uh, it's changing. There's a lot of hope on this front, but it is a, it is a problem that uh, it's very expensive. A lot of it's been imported, uh, it's getting better, but then costs, just as it started to get better in Africa, costs doubled because of the rising energy prices. So once two steps forward, one step back in this kind of a, 
Uh, and so most farmers, when they use it, will use it at very little, uh, at all, if at all. So there have been environmentalists that say, oh, you're promoting the use of fertilizer, you're going to ruin the environment. Well, if you do it like uh, farmers in, in uh, parts of India or the U.S. do it, yeah. But if you give them a little bit of fertilizer, there's no way that this is going to affect the environment, except in a nice way. Uh, and in Africa, Igrisat that uh, Adina mentioned is working with national programs just on these pro uh, micro-dosing where you take a bottle cap, the Coca-Cola bottle cap, fill it with the fertilizer, and just put it right where you plant the plant. Uh, you can see quite good results. The Israelis, is that too loud? The Israelis, uh, a few Israelis anyway, have uh, worked with uh, some of these national programs on African market gardens in West Africa. And, and of course, if fertilizer is expensive, if irrigation technology is difficult to set up, but if you're going to make this investment, then if you can put the fertilizer in the drip right at the seed, you will save on fertilizer, you will save on water, the more efficient these delivery systems are. And uh, so these things that have been developed for advanced agriculture in Israel, it's all a matter of cost, getting it down, getting it down, getting it down to where farmers can afford it. Um, this is something I learned about a year or so ago. I was sort of fascinated by it. Um, there's a field in soil science <coughs> uh, with something called biochar. Oops, I went wrong thing. Here, biochar. Uh, it's a soil amendment. And the research on biochars came from people that were studying what are called the terra preta soils found in Amazonia, in the Amazon River. Here's what a terra preta soil looks like. Here's what soil that's not terra preta. And this came from slash and burn agriculture of the Indian population in South America. And basically, in slash and burn, they cut to clear the land, to do agriculture, they created these soils that are basically filled with a kind of charcoal, if you like, uh, that is created and now the science is showing that, you know, it has to be a, py a pyrolysis, a kind of very high temperature burning process that makes these soils and they are, uh, if you have the right kind of cook stove, uh, rather than an old-fashioned one, you can, uh, as you're cooking, you, your wood is turned into this kind of charcoal. It's a pyrolytic cook stove. Uh, and so then you're not only gathering, you're using um, the products of, uh, of uh, plants to get your heat, but you're also then creating this biochar, which uh, if you add it to the soils, uh, has a number of, it, it apparently, mostly it's an ion exchange or, a, or hydrophobic interactions with different elements in the soil. There's a lot more research needed on this, and we need much more work on chemistry and so on, but the results can be quite dramatic. And this stuff hangs around, as you see from the Terra soils. They're still good soils from Amazon and Indians that were hundreds of years before. So uh, it's a very interesting area of research, uh, lots of questions that can be asked. And I don't know Ellen Gleiber, but I see from the website of Olkani that Ellen is involved in this biochar network uh, internationally. Um, and so it's just an, another way. We, there's so much chemistry there that could be done that's really good uh, to see whether the, what's the real potential of this on a big scale. Uh, I, I was interested, in, I got kind of fascinated by zeolites when, for very long, for crazy reasons. Uh, these are the, oops, these are aluminosilicate uh, cages. Uh, it's a certain, comes out of certain rock deposits in specialized places in the world. And they have the ability to trap both water and cations. Uh, and it's, it's another one of these soil amendments that you put in. It, increases the water holding capacity and the exchange capacity for uh, positively charged ions. And they have a lot of uses uh, in the horticulture world that loves these amendments. Uh, they put them in the pots. Uh, it's also interesting that they're used in animal feed. 
uh, to get rid of the smells in these terrible animal factories that, with the waste of the of the uh, animals, um, the the zeolites will will trap it and it can be exchanged out. Wastewater treatment and uh, the issue of no question these are fantastic, but they're expensive. So as I said, in agriculture only in horticulture right now. Um, turns out Kenya, Ethiopia has some of the world's largest deposits of zeolites. And there's a little bit of work from what I can tell exploring those, but what's the potential? Once again, questions that could involve plant science, chemistry, uh, geology, and so on. So that's, a, that's an interesting field, I think. Um, if there's one thing that if you've ever stayed a night in a village, second, I grew up in one, and I've stayed only a few nights in a village, it's amazing to, to really sit and live in a place that, where there's zero power. Your cell phone is, doesn't work. There, once it's dark, the world goes to sleep. It is a different, different world. And, and if you look at this, what percent of the population has electricity? in these countries. And you think about trying to make advances in agriculture, anything, uh, you see that the lack of power is a serious issue in uh, addressing uh, rural poverty. And it's not just Africa, actually. Um, in Asia, in India, a surprising number of uh, areas still have, are inaccessible. And if you look at it with respect to agriculture, you know, it limits a lot of things that we take for, for granted. Now, I can tell you that before rural electrification in the United States, uh, I was not quite born, but I was born just after, another decade after that. Still on every farm was a windmill. You know? There was a windmill, and then rural electrification came. Well, it changed the way farming was done. But these things are now sort of coming back again, right, <laughs> as costs rise. But uh, farmers, these farmers use biofuels, but they'd rather not. Uh, uh, and uh, I think what's interesting is that in, in Africa, the cell phone has transformed communication. Absolutely. In the developing world, everywhere. It's so appropriate because you don't need a grid system of lines. It's cheap. It, you can now, Kenya is a leader in banking on the cell phone. Um, it's an amazing device. It requires very little power to charge. And what's kind of interesting, as I read, that the cell phone is so popular that it's driving Africans to say, I need a local source of power to charge it. So charging the cell phone becomes business with those that have a little bit of power. Uh, and uh, I would predict that the lack of an extensive electrical grid, uh, it'll be the same story that if we can develop, if the world can develop appropriate local sources of power, then the same thing may happen that happened with the telephone. There will never be landlines laid in Africa for telephones. If you had really advanced way to create power in a local sense, you might not need to lay the electric grid either to many of these rural areas. So it's one of those things that is potentially possible. Uh, here's an example of Israeli-designed gravity feed agriculture uh, irrigation system in West Africa. Um, just tanks, gravity feed. You'd like to fill the tanks and not with by hand from somewhere, so you would like to have a pump, uh, a simple pump. And so these can be coupled with now with solar-powered pumps. But now I'm going to challenge you to go back to basic science and think about photosynthesis for a minute. Um, Daniel Osera and his colleagues at MIT are, are leaders in, in a field that of, uh, it's basically, he, he likes to call his model personalized energy, where every household could have its own energy system that's self-contained. Uh, but um, there's also artificial photosynthesis, thinking about, okay, we know what plants do, they take sun, they use the energy, and they make sugar, that gives us energy. But you, we don't want sugar in our cars, or we want to, instead of making sugar, we'd like to make 
hydrogen or fuels or something. So can we do artificially design uh, solar collecting systems that then coupled to making fuels directly? And so in, the, in a model like this, what you do is during the daytime, you, you have a solar panel on your roof, and Daniel's been working on much cheaper solar panels. So have a lot of people now, the Chinese are now leaders in that. Uh, and during the daytime, it's just like a solar panel, you know? You generate energy from that to produce. But now, the problem of solar power, the big problem is storage. How do you store the energy? So what you need to do, you have this solar cell that will split water at neutral pH, because you don't want to be doing this at drastic extremes. And then at night, or in low sunlight, uh, what happens, you split water, and it's converted. The energy from the sun then is used. Uh, the excess energy in the daytime is used to split water to make hydrogen that's stored and used at night. So. Uh, hydrogen storage is an issue, but there's chemistry going around making different uh, forms of, of hydrides that might be stored. So this is thinking about the original photosynthesis model, but converting it. And actually, there are people really looking at photosynthesis itself, how we can make, make an artificial leaf. And that's another area of research. And the energetics say this is quite feasible. He has systems that it works. It, you can get enough power with his current system to power a household, an American household, which uses quite a bit of energy. Um, am I out of time? Yes. OK. I just want to end with this, that the great American land grab is a great American, African land grab. There's a lot going on in consolidation of farms in Africa that is disturbing. Uh, there's a lot of uh, millions of acres being leased long term to the Chinese and others. This is kind of scary stuff. And I think that the whole community of scientists, of policymakers, of uh, economists, all sorts of sociologists need to think much more about what is, uh, what is farm consolidation all about. It's going to happen. The small farm always goes to bigger farms as agriculture progresses. But what's a good pro-poor way to think about that? And I think you and Israel have experimented with the kibbutz system. You know you have a big Russian community, knows the Soviet system. You probably have a lot of minds here who should think about, in the context of farm consolidation, to develop real models that are pro-poor and what are the issues around that in the economics. And you in the universities, I know. How are you going to get involved in all this? You've got, you're overcommitted like crazy. You don't have a lot of opportunities to get involved. Uh, so uh, how do you do it? Well, you don't have any incentives either. You know, who's going to give you some money to, do, so to work on these problems? Uh, but I think within the university system, the leadership needs to look at some incentives, if not money at least, are that uh, people that do work on these problems, they're not going to publish in Science or Nature. They, you know, maybe you give credit if somebody publishes in the African Journal of Crop Science. Um, uh, competitive awards, sabbatical programs, really bringing rewards that are go both directions. And it's lovely to see the university thinking about all these issues. And thank you very much.